Hi, my name is Dr. Matthew Getz. I am a breast medical oncologist at the Mayo Clinic, uh, and uh, specifically within the Mayo Clinic Cancer Center, uh, and as a member of the Department of Oncology. I'm uh, uh, really excited to be here at ASCO to talk a little bit about some of the uh, great work that has been uh, uh, presented here at this meeting. One of the very important publications uh, and presentations that has recently come out is the data from Paloma 2. The Paloma 2 clinical trial uh, was uh, a trial, registration trial, uh, using palbociclib along with endocrine therapy uh, in the first line metastatic setting. This trial has shown a substantial progression free survival benefit uh, for patients uh, with uh, ER positive HER2 negative breast cancer when palbociclib is used along with endocrine therapy. And uh, this the benefit is actually uh, not small, but it's actually approaches actually uh, 12 months. And so we've been eagerly awaiting uh, the results of the survival data uh, because we have data from the other CDK4-6 inhibitors, ribociclib uh, in the first line setting, as well as abemaciclib in the second line setting, demonstrating that these CDK4-6 inhibitors prolong survival. So we've been eagerly waiting the results of the survival data. And interestingly, what we saw was that there was no survival advantage uh, for uh, utilizing palbociclib uh, along with endocrine therapy versus endocrine therapy alone. And this, of course, contrasts uh, with the uh, results of several trials utilizing ribociclib. So I think a lot of questions have come up about why is this, um, as it relates to different populations. Uh, the presenters showed some data with disease-free uh, interval of less than or greater than or equal to 12 months. And these are hypothesis generating, uh, but they certainly wouldn't change at this point my recommendation for patients. And my recommendations for patients, of course, would be to utilize a drug that has been clearly shown to induce or result in a survival benefit. And so uh, as we think a little bit about this in terms of how it changes our practice, I think many oncologists are going, as they have that very, uh, uh, very important conversation with their patients. Uh, will be utilizing a drugs and drugs uh, that have a proven uh, track record of prolonging survival. As you know, uh, survival is the gold standard. Now there are still some data that are eagerly waited. We have the results of the Monarch 3 uh, bevacyclib uh, uh, survival analysis, which we hope will be present probably in the next uh, year or two, and perhaps that will also shed some light. Uh, on whether a bemaciclub prolongs survival in the first line setting. We know it prolongs survival in the second line setting, and of course we know that a bemaciclub uh, uh, was effective as an adjuvant therapy in high risk uh, uh, ER positive for two negative breast cancer in the adjuvant setting. So uh, those data certainly are eagerly awaited, and of course we are very much uh, waiting for the data from Natalie, uh, which was a clinical trial uh, that took women again with early stage ER positive HER2 negative breast cancer, but, in, but with higher risk features. So some of these patients had uh, 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 a higher stage or more aggressive features. And in that clinical trial, uh, ribociclib uh, was utilized uh, and the comparative of course is standard uh, adjuvant endocrine therapy. So the Natalie trial will be the third trial to read out in the adjuvant setting. And so we certainly are going to be eagerly awaiting those data. All this being said, for the treatment of ER positive or to negative breast cancer, these uh, uh, trials that have tested these three drugs, palbociclib, ribociclib, and abemaciclib, certainly have given us very important data. Uh, I think one of the things originally when we first saw the data is we thought all these CDK4-6 inhibitors were the same. They clearly are not. They are uh, substantially different. They're different in terms of their biological effects. They're different in terms of their side effect profile and they're different in terms of their efficacy profile as well. And I think uh, uh, it's just taken some time to really uh, demonstrate that, but we certainly have data for that now. Um, as we think a little bit about what are the next steps, I think one of the great uh, areas that is really important uh, is the post-CDK4-6 space. So once patients progress on a CDK4-6 inhibitor, what are the next steps? And certainly there is uh, many mechanisms for resistance to CDK4-6 inhibitors. This is quite heterogeneous, but there are some very important targets that are emerging. One of those targets is the ESR1 uh, mutations, and these uh, seem to uh, occur, uh, of course, at the time of progression. 
and there are several clinical trials that are looking uh, to target the ESR1 mutations. There are new drugs, such as the drug lazofloxacine. Uh, there are SIRDs. Uh, many of them have, have already been studied and showed a bit of a signal that they may be beneficial in this space. And another thing that's very exciting is uh, utilizing the idea of circulating tumor DNA and actually switching patients to a different drug early on before there's clinical evidence of progression, but actually switching at the time of molecular evidence. And this is uh, also an exciting area. There was one study that suggested that this may be a very um, a good way to go. That was the PADA-1 trial that was presented at San Antonio. And now there's a new trial that's ongoing called the Serena-6 trial which is testing AstraZeneca's oral CERD in the same uh, setting. So this is a very exciting uh, 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 setting that is the post-CDK4-6 space and for uh, drug development in general. And so I think as we, as we move forward, uh, we will certainly uh, be faced with how do we incorporate these new drugs into our practice. Um, and, and probably the most exciting data that was presented at this meeting was the data with uh, trastuzumab deruxtecan in patients with ER positive HER2 negative breast cancer with the so-called HER2 low. Uh, these patients generally, uh, after they have progressed on CDK4-6 inhibitors and exhausted all endocrine therapy, have very low response rates, uh, response rates in that range of 10 to 15% and, and relatively uh, poor survival. And so trastuzumab deruxtecan was compared to these single agents and there was a substantial benefit, but most importantly, there was a survival of benefit. It's the gold standard. Patients live longer uh, when they receive trastuzumab deruxtecan than when they receive these standard agents. So this changes our practice uh, Monday morning, which again is today. Uh, so we will uh, begin to use trastuzumab deruxtecan in our patients uh, who have ER positive, HER2 negative, uh, so-called HER2 low. There was also an interesting subset in that study of patients with triple negative who also had HER2 low also seemed to derive substantial benefit and certainly this deserves uh, further study as well. So lots of very good things happening here at this meeting. Uh, this has substantial implications for our patients but overall uh, we are definitely seeing improvements. We're seeing improvements in survival incredibly exciting and, we're, and most important we're seeing improvements in survival in these settings that have been very difficult to treat these refractive settings so really good news for patients